So lastly, we have uh, Professor Victor Kla, all the way from uh, Florida in the United States. Professor Kla is the BBNT Distinguished Professor of Free Enterprise at Florida Gulf Coast University and an affiliate scholar of the Acton Institute. Uh, he's written uh, interesting topics, so it's, I, I, if, I, if I say um, economics and Christian perspective, as well as fair trade. Uh, its prospects is a poverty solution, which is really to help us rethink how we consume. So, uh, Professor Victor Kla. very much. Um, it's, uh, it's great to be here with you. You know, in 2018, I think there's a lot of worry and concern, especially in my country, the United States, that maybe we're approaching the end of work, or we're developing so much tech new technology so quickly, including things like self-driving cars, that eventually there simply won't be enough work available for human beings to do. And human beings will become trivial and we'll need to discover a way to care for them in ways that previously we hadn't had the necessity to do, nor the luxury to do. But humanity has already, always had these fears. We've had these fears regarding assembly lines, that so many individuals would be able to get so much work done that we'd have surplus workers. We've thought the same thing about automation and eventually robotics. Um, we always seem to be about 20 years away from flying cars, but everybody's always been concerned about the future of work and whether or not over time you and I would become unnecessary. Now, the, this has a good possibility. The good possibility could be that we could live lives that are less dangerous, more contemplative. We could have the opportunity to spend more time with our families. But the other possibility is that we lose a sense of who we are as individuals. If, in fact, we really do accomplish something not only externally, to ourselves, but also internally within ourselves when we work, then a future without work is a conflicted future. But other people really do need our work, from small businesses like coffee growing to large-scale CEOs. And let me tell you for a moment about my own father. My father was born in 1929 at the beginning of the Great Depression. His father fled when he was two years old, and so only his mother, who had a fourth grade education, was left to raise my father and my father's two brothers. So my father always had to work. He had to work as a child to help provide for himself and his mom and his brothers. In fact, when my father graduated from high school, there were only 12 students in his graduating class because so many students were at home, otherwise students were at home working to provide for their families. And in that class of just 12, there were only two boys. Why? Because mostly the boys were at home working to provide for their families. So my father worked as a young person. He worked through high school. He worked full time to put himself through private college. And once he was married and found my mother, um, because I hadn't been born yet, then both my mother and my father worked while he pursued graduate study. And then he worked a full and long career and eventually retired. But here's what's really interesting about my father. After he retired, he didn't stop working. He continued to work. In fact, in his retirement, with a pension, at times he was working two different jobs at the same time. Why? Because he needed and wanted to work. So there was something personal in it for my father that wasn't based only on the money. He needed to work. He felt vital and important and significant and he felt like he was of service to others when he was engaged in work, whatever that work was. The other thing about work is, even when you've had a great day at work, even when you've had a terrible day at work, there are other people on the other side of the market who are thankful that you're there performing your meaningful work. So one of the jobs that my father had in his retirement illustrates this well. It's not a job that you would see or notice. He was a bank courier, and he basically took coins and small bills from one local bank branch to another local bank branch and did this throughout the day as needed. So bank customers never saw my father. They didn't know that my father was working hard for them. They didn't know that he was retired. They didn't know that he had two boys, and one of them was named Victor. 
They didn't know any of these things. What they did know is that the bank was functioning well. The bank was functioning properly, why? Because my father was joyfully pursuing the work that he loved in the service of others, even during his retirement. Another reason that work matters, though, is it's not just about the work. Um, a good example here, a good parallel is going to the gym. When we go to the gym, we lift weights, or we exercise and we run. But it's never about how much weight we've moved that day. It's never about how, how far we've run that day. In fact, there's an American comedian who used to tell this joke. Um, when my mother turned 40 years old, she decided to walk one mile every day. Well, that was three years ago, and today we don't, don't have any idea where she is. <laughs> so why was she walking a mile every day? Was it to go somewhere? No, it was for something to change within herself. That's why she was walking a mile every day. And the same thing happens with us. You know from your own work experience, I know from my father's life, father's life experience that he became a better person because of what he learned at work. And what he learned at work made him a better person not only at work, it made him a better father, it made him a better husband, it made him a better friend. Every time we participated in labor, we get better at that labor. Adam Smith recognized this. He realized that when individuals performed one task over and over, they got more creative about doing that same task and understood it better than anyone else did. My mother was fortunate enough not to work while we were children, but she was also working. She just wasn't working in the economy for money. She was nevertheless learning how to raise us. And there's no question that she did a great job with me, but I'm convinced that she did an even better job with my younger brother when he came along because she had learned from her mistakes and she had learned to love her job. So that's the other thing that's really interesting about work is you don't automatically, instantly, immediately upon your first day of hire become a great worker. I know this wasn't true for me when I had my first job at the age of 11 or when I had my second job at the age of 15. I learned to be a better person and I learned how to work through those experiences so that today I serve my students at Florida Gulf Coast University more effectively than I ever would have at the beginning of my teaching career. So other people need our valuable service and we ourselves need to be creative in our work and learn how to be better people than we currently are through the practice of effective work. What does this mean for the future of work then? It means that our respect for the dignity of others means that we have to be respectful of the possibility of others to have the same experience that we've had through our work. So respect for the dignity of the human person respects the dignity of the human person to work. So as we contemplate the future of work, work and what automation and other technical advances might mean for the future of work, we shouldn't be thinking about how to take care of all the people who won't be working in the future because that doesn't respect their dignity. That doesn't respect them as a human person. Instead, what we need to be thinking about is how can we create a society full of opportunity for people to engage in creative work in the service of others in ways that we understand today and in ways that maybe we don't understand today because the economy is constantly evolving and changing in ways that we never thought possible. And I'm still waiting for those flying cars because I think that would be really exciting to have. So if we think about what this means then for future society, I find this quote from John Maynard Keynes helpful. John Maynard Keynes, father of modern macroeconomics, he wrote an essay called Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren. And he wrote this in about 1930, and he was thinking about the year 2030. Not that far away. It was far, far away for John Maynard Keynes when he wrote Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren, but it's not that far away for us now. And Keynes, in 1930, writing Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren, he was convinced that by today, we would, would have accomplished so much, created so much value, earned so much interest through thrift and saving, over time through discovery of technology, that 12 years from now, less than 12 years from now, 
we'll be in a position where nobody will ever need to work anymore at all. Now, I understand why John Maynard Keynes thought this. The Industrial Revolution had happened, and he was also living in 1930. So when he was thinking about future society, he was thinking of a society that looked like a 1930 society. So a society before smartphones, a society before the internet, a society before the polio vaccine. This is a society that John Maynard Keynes had in mind when he thought that by now we would have accomplished so much that we could live lives of leisure and relax and enjoy each other's company and a cup of tea and a good book. But Keynes has it wrong. What we need to be thinking about the future of work is not how to give people early retirement and keep them occupied. Instead, what we need to think about is how we create a society of opportunity so that all the magnificent wonders that have unfolded since 1930 that John Maynard Keynes couldn't even have imagined, they continue to unfold in ways that we today can't possibly imagine. So our future, the future of work, and the future of our own grandchildren depends on an opportunity society where when we think about welfare, it's not welfare that we provide each other from a societal perspective. Instead, it's the good. It's the social good. It's the welfare of all that we need to promote through an opportunity society that leads to even greater, grander economic possibilities for our own, our own grandchildren. Thanks very much. Victor, thank you very much, Victor. I'd like to invite you to join the panel. Uh, this is the